What is up, you nerds? Thank you so much for coming back. Again, my name is Nate. It's so good to see you again. Been a little while, but I have some exciting news. I just received the brand new 70 to 200 F2.8 G Master from Sony. This is the brand new version of one of their most classic lenses, and I'm super excited to talk about it. It is just a powerhouse of a lens. It is a full pound lighter than the previous version, unbelievably sharp. It has about a third of the focus distance. Now, of course, any review of this lens would be incomplete without comparing it to its big brother, the original 70-200 f2.8 G Master. But I also am going to compare it to the 70-200 f4. The reasoning for that is that I actually have never owned the original G Master. I found it to be too heavy, it was pretty sharp, but it just didn't offer enough advantages for me personally over the F4. This is the lens that I've spent the most time with, and it's actually a lens that I still own, even though I got the new 70-200 F2.8 G Master. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about why I'm doing that and the reasoning. So the biggest headline when this new lens was announced was the weight, and I think that's probably the number one reason that most photographers are going to buy this lens, especially if they already own the previous version. Uh, and it actually is fairly substantial. They claim to have cut the weight down by a full pound from 3.23 pounds down to 2.3 pounds. For those of you who are smart and use the metric system, that's reduced from 1,480 grams down to 1,045 grams. So shaved off 440-ish grams. Now, one thing to note when I got this lens, I popped it on my little baking scale, and I realized that uh, I was getting a reading of 1,677 grams on the old one, which is quite a bit higher than the listed weight of 1,480. So I started putzing around with it. I took off the lens hood, which reduced the weight. I took off the tripod foot, which reduced the weight. And then I realized if I took off both lens caps, then I ended up actually hitting the listed weight. So keep that in mind that when you are reading these listed weights for all of these three lenses, it actually is the weight with literally nothing on it. No lens hood, no tripod foot, and neither lens cap. So if you're like me and you wanna count ounces and grams in your backpacks for a long expedition, that is actually important to note. And that brings me to my first endorsement of the 70 to 200 F4. So on the new 70 to 200 uh, G Master and the old one, when the tripod foot comes off, it literally is just the foot itself slides off and the heavy rotating collar remains on the camera, which is, it's pretty minor, but it means that you're actually not shaving that much weight by taking the foot off. Now for the old 70 to 200, when you take that foot off, you actually remove the entire tripod collar itself, which to me, I actually love that because if I'm not taking the tripod foot with me, I also don't need the collar. There's no advantage to having it there, and that's further weight savings. And so you can see actually earlier when I popped this on the scale and I took off the hood and the foot and everything, I got it down to 838 grams, which is extremely lightweight for a 70 to 200. And one of the reasons I bring that up is because I have actually climbed this to the top of dozens of mountains. I've taken it on multi-week backpacking trips. And part of the reasoning is that it's very lightweight. I wish it was a little bit sharper. I wish it was a little bit faster in the aperture. And honestly, it misses focus somewhat often. But the ability to take off this tripod collar and everything and shave the weight down that much, to me, is pretty substantial. So the new 70 to 200 is listed at 1,045 grams. But again, that is the purely naked lens with nothing attached. Now, with everything on it, the hood and the foot, etc., I got a weight of 1,262 grams. So a little bit heavier, but still substantially lighter than the old one. Another thing that people aren't talking about a ton on this lens that I actually love is the minimum focusing distance. They cut it down significantly. So for the old G Master, the minimum focusing distance was about 38 inches. On the old F4, the minimum focusing distance was about 39 inches. And on this new one, the minimum focusing distance is 15.7 inches, less than half. Uh, it's worth noting that I actually didn't know that that change happened, but last night while shooting in my backyard, testing some things out, I struggled to focus the previous two lenses and then this one easily snapped focus on this really close object and it kind of blew my mind and I realized that was something that I really enjoyed. And with that f2.8 aperture, the ability to focus that close gives you some really fun 
nearly macro lens capabilities for photography. So now that we have fully dissected all of the, the weight differences, et cetera, on this lens, probably more than any of you really care about, but I carry these lenses pretty long distances. So for me, that's important. I do wanna get into some sample photos. Let's be honest, that's why you're all actually here. So the best testing I could think of was just in my backyard last night. I shot some very boring photos of a wooden fence, but I figured they would be good to show the sharpness of the three lenses at various apertures, just to kind of give you an idea of what sort of performance increase you can expect by spending double or triple the amount of money on one of the G Masters versus the F4. So to get started, looking through the first G Master, I shot this photo at 70 millimeters wide open at f2.8. And zooming in on the center here, you can see it's very sharp. There's really just no way around it. It is a sharp lens in the center. It looks great. Now coming up into the corners here, not quite as sharp wide open, which does surprise me. This is still a G Master lens, but of course it is one of the very first G Master lenses. And the technology has come a long ways in the last few years. There is some purple fringing around these edges. This is a little bit of a backlit fence up here. So you can see some magenta fringing, but other than that, it looks pretty great. Moving to the next image here, uh, I stopped this one down to F4. Again, the corner starting to look way sharper, but we still have that magenta fringing. Center, of course, very sharp. And moving to the next shot at F5.6, also very sharp in the center and looking really good up in the corner. Still have some magenta fringing. Uh, I think that's probably fine. That's so negligible compared to some of the lenses I've seen. Something that's worth noting, if you look at this photo zoomed all the way out though, you can see the vignette change from f2.8 to f4. I find that kind of interesting. Now, I don't know if I would notice it if I wasn't flipping back and forth from identical photos with different apertures, but it's worth noting that the original G Master does have a vignette wide open that disappears at f4 and remains gone through f5.6 and then at f8. Now zoomed in at 200, you can see uh, still some vignette issues, but from f2.8 zoomed in at 200 millimeters, incredibly, incredibly sharp. And up in the corners, same thing. A uh, little bit softer up there actually, now that I'm looking at it. I think it's excusably soft and probably would be in a way that you'd find pleasing in a photo since in general your subject is going to be in this center third-ish region. You're never gonna have your subject way in the corners, especially with a telephoto lens. But uh, it's worth noting. Stopped down to F4 here. We're looking at a little bit of a sharper corner. So we'll go back to the 2.8 here so you can really see the comparison. You can see this wood grain really does sharpen up, moving to F4. And then at F5.6, we're starting to look pretty good. We're getting a little more like sensor noise here because my ISO had to go up, of course, when I stopped down. And then by F8, the corners are perfectly sharp, no fringing, everything looks great. Now, the new G Master at F2.8 wide open, incredibly sharp in the corner or in the center and then scrolling out to the corners also very sharp now you'll notice there's no magenta fringing in the corners at all even wide open at f2.8 which i find really fascinating there's sort of a hint of a blue cast going on these slats i think that's just kind of light bleed because we have a bright white sky behind the wood but there's no magenta fringing to my eye which i think is really really cool Going from f2.8 to f4, you can see that there is a slight vignette change, but it's very, very small. Uh, they didn't get fully rid of it, but again, not sure I'm, I'm super concerned with that because I don't think you'd notice it if they weren't back-to-back -back identical photos. Stopped down to f5.6 now, we're gonna go look very sharp in the center and honestly, unbelievably sharp in the corners as well. Maybe slightly less sharp than the center, but um, I'm so impressed by that. I wouldn't hesitate at all to use a photo from the corner of the frame, which is pretty crazy and very valuable if you're like me and you suck really bad at tracking moving subjects with a telephoto lens. By the time we get to F8, everything is very uniform across the board. Sharp in the middle, sharp in the corner, 
absolutely no color bleeding whatsoever there. The blue that I was looking at earlier even is gone. Zoomed in to 200, uh, extremely sharp all the way through, even up to the corners. Ooh, we're getting a little bit softer at 200 millimeters up in the corner here. Um, you can definitely see, not maybe necessarily uh, out of focus, but it doesn't look nearly as sharp. You could argue that at 200 millimeters, um, the thing in the corner is maybe a little further away from the from the center of the frame than whatever's in the center, just kind of the laws of physics. It's, you know, we're talking about a little bit of a hypotenuse there. Um, but that said, this is a little bit less sharp than I would expect. Stopped down to f 5.6, however, we're immediately getting into something considerably sharper. Uh, I would say almost all of that corner softness has disappeared and we're looking at a very, very sharp image. Center, beautiful. So the original 7200, the F4 lens, here it is at F4, uh, 70 millimeters. Now you'll notice as I go from F4 to F5.6, there is a massive vignette that disappears. Um, just stopping down to f5.6. I find that kind of funny. Uh, like I said, not the most technically perfect lens, but it's very lightweight and very portable, and I love it for that reason. Now at f4, looking into the center, this is not very sharp at all, which, you know, it is what it is. You're getting what you pay for on this lens. In the corners, again, not sharp at all at f4. Tons of magenta fringing around this uh, wooden slat. Now in the center here, stopping down to f5.6, you can see it is very, very sharp. Uh, stopping down even further to f8, suddenly we're talking G Master levels of sharpness. Uh, the corners look magnificent on this lens though, uh, especially at f5.6 and f8. Now zoomed into 200 millimeters, again, wide open at f4, not super impressive. <laughs> That's what, This lens took a lot of heat when it was first released. Uh, I still like it, but this is not, you know, it's not going to make a, a museum for sure. <laughs> the corners, yeah, as expected. Stopping it down a little bit to 5.6 now, we're talking, looking much, much better. Very sharp in the center, a little bit better in the corners, starting to eh, be a little more passable. And as we get to F8, the corners are getting sharper, and of course the center is beautiful. So I mentioned that I did take this lens up to Churchill to photograph polar bears and Arctic foxes, which was cool. And we're gonna get into those photos a little bit, but those are white on white. So it's a you know white subject on a white background. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, contrast to be spoken of. So they're just kind of cool photos to see and I love to look at them, but they're not great for determining contrast, bokeh, uh, bokeh roll off, any of that sort of sharpness on the animal. So the cool thing is last night while I was taking those extremely boring photos of the fence, the feral cats that live under my shed decided to come out and play. And I would say that they are as close to wild animals as you can get without actually finding wild animals. I've been feeding them and trying to force them to love me for almost a year now, and they won't even let me get within 30 feet of them, which makes it a perfect test subject for a close wildlife lens like the 70 to 200. So look at this beautiful little kitty here. If we zoom in on it, you can see that that is unbelievably sharp. The detail on this, uh, and also look at my settings over here. I shot this at f2.8, 1 640th of a second, and you can see every single individual hair on this cat's face. You can see the lines in his retina uh, at, you know, probably 30 meters away at 200 millimeters at 100% crop, that's incredible to me. And the other cat in the background here, let's go to the one where they're both looking at us so we can really compare. The one in focus, incredibly sharp. The one in the background, I love the way this bokeh roll off looks. It's, uh, you know, sometimes you get like specular bokeh where you can kind of see the light beams crossing each other. This is just perfectly smooth. It just drops off into like a satin background. It almost looks like I, cut out the cat that's in focus and used the Gaussian blur feature in Photoshop to make the background look softer. It's so unbelievably uniform and so smooth around the edges. I'm unbelievably impressed with that. And switching them around, focusing on the cat in the back so that the one in the foreground is even extra out of focus, same thing. 
extremely sharp. You can see every individual hair in his ears and his little whiskers and everything. But then the guy in the front here is just a perfect white blob. You're starting to see a little bit of that more specular bokeh around his ears here. You can kind of see layers of ear rather than like a perfectly creamy, uh, out of focus bokeh cat. But I am still so impressed with that. And even out of the center of the frame, look at these leaves down here, incredibly sharp. And again, these are entirely unedited raw images directly out of the lens and the camera. So there's not even any sharpening effects or any sort of contrast adjustment. I'm blown away by how good the color rendering is on this lens. So we did have this little kitty get pretty dang close to us. And as a bonus, he has uh, beautiful blue eyes, which are very nice to look at. So this is a good example of a real bokeh roll off. He got about as close as any cat has, not nearly the minimum focusing distance for this lens, but you can see again, unbelievably sharp on him. And then the background is perfectly uniform. You can't even tell what's going on back there. It's just beautiful, soft edges. And so now we get down to the most important question, probably the actual reason that you're here watching this video. Is this lens worth buying over one of these two lenses? Or more importantly, if you already own one or both of these two, is it worth buying this in addition or selling those for this? And I have to say, I do think unequivocally the answer is yes. Uh, I own the F4, my girlfriend owns the F2.8 we're both selling our old ones to buy the new one, if that tells you anything. It's, uh, you know, I never bought the original G Master. Didn't make sense to me. It's twice the weight, it was twice the price for not twice the performance. This one comes in a little bit more. It's about $2,800, which I understand is substantial, probably close to triple the price you can get the F4 lens for nowadays on the used market. But this is more than triple the performance, in my opinion especially if you're shooting on a camera like the Alpha One or the A7R IV. This is gonna have so much more resolving power for those high resolution sensors. I really don't think you'll regret it. The portability is exceptional. The image quality is exceptional. And I truly think if you're a big fan of high quality images, and I don't think you'd be watching YouTube videos about lenses if you weren't, this is going to be worth the extra money. And it will be an incredible addition to any one of your bags. Uh, I'm very excited to use this. Maybe I'll post an update video in a couple months after I have some more sample images of it. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching this. Stay nerdy.